the last topic we talked about was normal tangential coordinate system. As you remember from Wednesday, you have two unit vectors, one tangent to the path and toward the motion. So this is like toward the motion. And one is normal to the path, which goes toward the center of the curvature. Then you can find the curvature, the radius of curvature, if the path is given as a function. The way we calculate displacement is the length of the curve that the object or the particle goes through. When you find the velocity, the change of this ds over time is going to be velocity. The magnitude is tangent to the path. So we use the tangent unit vector times the magnitude of velocity. And when we want to find acceleration, we technically did take the time derivative of this because v and ut both vary, both have time derivatives. And when you do that, at the end, you end up two components of acceleration. One is tangent to the path of motion, and one is perpendicular to the path of motion. So you have tangential acceleration, and you have normal acceleration. Tangential acceleration comes from the change of the value of the velocity. For example, you go from 60 mile to 72 mile over a few seconds, that change of velocity is V dot. And normal acceleration comes from the curvature of the path. So even if your velocity is constant, you may lose the tangential component of acceleration, but you still have the normal component of acceleration. And if you move on a straight line, let's go back here. You see V squared over rho. How much is the radius of curvature for a straight line? Hmm? Zero. The radius of curvature for a straight line is zero. If your curvature opens and opens and opens and get to the, I don't know, you can see my hands toward a straight line, what happens to the radius? Becomes a smaller or bigger? Big. Bigger. So technically, for a straight line, radius of curvature is infinity, right? It's like a straight line is a part of a circle with infinity radius, right? Now, if you look at here, this equation, when rho is infinity, how much is this term? Zero. Zero, right? That's why when the particle moves on a straight line, you have only tangential acceleration, which is obviously along the length of the path, and it's like rectilinear motion. This is what we discussed on Monday. Now we're going to do a couple of examples. I'm going to start with this example first. You have this snowy path. You have this particle, two kids going on this path. The curvature or the equation for the path is given, right? The problem says find the magnitude of acceleration when A or this guys reach the point A. Point A has the coordinate system of 60 meter in X and 36 meter in Y, okay? So at this particular point, you want to see how much is the magnitude of acceleration for this object or particle. The path of motion is given, the velocity is given 10 meter per second, and it says, the velocity is increasing at the rate of three meter per square second. When it says the velocity is increasing, technically this is this three, the number three is V dot. If you go back to this equation, this is the rate of the change of velocity, right? So when the problem says 
this is three, that means your V dot is three. I'm gonna give you a minute to draw this and get the numbers. And I will do that on my tablet so we can solve this problem. Any suggestion how we solve this problem? Would it be like the normal constant acceleration equation since we're going at a rate of three meters per second squared? Can you repeat that? Um, using the equations of constant acceleration, since we have three meters per second squared. Constant acceleration? What kind of motion we have here? Now that we are talking about curvilinear motion, if you remember, we talked about normal tangential and polar coordinate system, right? So in polar coordinate system, you have X and Y and some problems you learn that they are suitable to do it that way. The question is, in this case, should we go with tangential coordinate system or normal, sorry, normal tangential coordinate system or Cartesian coordinate system? It gives you X and Y. You may think I'm going to go with X and Y coordinate system. But if you look at that, there's nothing about like x dot, x double dot, y dot, y double dot, any of those things that we had before, right? So, of course, we are in normal tangential part of the course. You may say we're going to use that, but in quiz or exam or at work, when you would face a problem, it doesn't tell you which part of which book even, right? But here, if we consider normal tangential coordinate system, so consider NT system. A as a vector is going to be AT times UT plus AN times UN. Is this correct? Or as we know, AT is V dot and AN is V square over rho UN. Is this correct? This is just the equation you saw a couple of slides back. Now, the problem tells you how much V is, right? V is given as 10 meter per second. So you have this guy. It gives you the rate of the change of V, which is V dot three meter per square second. So this is also known. By the way, V dot is positive three or negative three. How do we know when is positive or negative? Remember, I told you guys, this component is always positive because V square is a number, positive number, and rho is radius, is a length, has to be positive. So V square over rho, which is normal acceleration, is always positive. That means if this is the way that this guy is going, right, the normal acceleration is going to be always like that. These people are coming down, so tangential acceleration is going to be like this. Right? Now, is it this way or this way? 
which one we go down with the velocity why because the sled is moving down and we're already increasing on acceleration exactly remember when v dot is positive or v is increasing v dot is positive right so it's going to go down just like that if it says decreasing with rate of blah blah then that's going to be negative that's how you understand positive negative for tangential acceleration okay now in this equation i have v dot i have v what is missing is technically rho right what was the equation for rho is this correct i don't trust my memory do you guys have it in your notes yeah right yep. okay so if that's the case let's find out the value for rho so y is 0.01 x square so y prime is going to be 0.02 x and y double prime is going to be 0.02 correct mm -hmm. we are talking about x equals 60 meter so at x equals 60 meter you get your y as 36 meter y prime as 0.12 what is the unit for this guy What is the unit? By the way, this is 1.2, right? Not 0.12. Yeah, it's 0.12. What is the unit here, guys? Meters per meters per second. Why second? Technically, y prime is dy dx y is a length so it's meter per meter is unitless right technically y prime is a slope slope is the angle angle doesn't have how about y double prime same this is meter square meter square then no unit. I just emphasis, emphasize on this because as engineers, as I mentioned before, it's important to understand the units. Now, and your Y double prime is 0 0.02. I'm gonna substitute these values here and see how much row is. And you guys do the same and calculate the row for me. See how much you get. You should get something like this. Just let me know if you get the same number or I did it wrong. Yeah. Okay. Now, AT is V dot, which is going to be three, and AN is V square over rho, which is going to be 10 square over 190.57 and then 
if you calculate that, it's going to give you 0.5247 meter per square second. Remember, this is meter per square second. Now, if you want to find the magnitude of A, how I can find the magnitude of A, the overall acceleration? Uh, square root of the two numbers squared. Exactly. A T square plus A N square square root. And if you do that, you are going to get 3.05 meter per square second. Looks good. Any yep. question about this? I have a question. In this case, why was AT positive? Sorry, I couldn't hear you. In this case, why is AT positive and when is negative? I just forgot that. Why this is AT what? Positive. Plus three? Yeah. Because the problem says, first of all, we know that AT from the equations, AT is V dot, right? Yeah. But what is V dot? The rate of the change of V, right? Mm -hmm. If it goes faster, V dot is positive. If it goes slower, for example, as I mentioned before, you are driving 50 miles an hour. You push the gas, you go to 63 right your velocity increases your v dot is bigger than zero zero then something happened you are driving 63 miles an hour and you push the brake and come to i don't know 35 when you reduce your velocity so this is for acceleration then if at which is v dot is going to be negative for deceleration right now the problem says the velocity is 10 meter per second and increases at the rate of three meter per square second, right? That rate is your V dot and is positive. Yeah, thank you. So any other question? Okay, let's go back to the slides and do one more problem. This is relatively simple problem, but it plays with the concept of normal acceleration. Is that you have two cars, the blue car and the red car. They're driving side by side on a road. Now, the path of blue is a half a circle. We are starting from this point because this is the same, right? We're starting from this point, going all the way to this point, from C to C. For the blue, it goes half a circle with the radius of this magnitude. For red, it goes straight a little bit and half a circle and then a straight. So technically, the center of curvature for this part is here. The center of curvature for this part is here. And those are half circles, so the radius is fixed. The, sense of, uh, the center of curvature is fixed. The problem says both of them will have lateral acceleration of point hg, right? We want to see if this is the maximum acceleration they can get. And both of them have constant speed, so V dot is zero. How long it takes for A and B to start from here and go there? Is the definition of problem clear?
you guys write the numbers and everything and then we'll solve the problem so the problem gives you r b and r a r b is 88 meter r a is 72 meter and now it says constant velocity so v dot will be zero and normal acceleration is limited to 0.8 g How do we solve this problem? Let me switch to the tablet again. I think this is something they call it road race or road rage or something like that, right? People go crazy on the street. First of all, the problem says the normal acceleration is limited to 0.8 G. Why this? Why we have to, or we may have to make this assumption? And where this come from? And I know we didn't talk about kinetics of particles, forces and everything but you guys have some idea from your physics one and before so i want to see can you tell me why a n is limited couldn't we go like 2g 3g 5g what limits the acceleration either normal or tangential for a car uh the friction of the tires exactly the, the friction is of the tire on the road right if they have the same tires right there's a certain amount of force they can create they can go beyond that and that certain amount of force will result in result in certain amount of acceleration that's why when you drive in a rainy road on a curved path you may slide out because the friction is less, is not going to give you enough acceleration to technically pre move through the curve, right? But we're going to talk about that later. I just want to kind of see if you have any idea. Okay, good. Now, how we do this? Obviously, V dot is zero for both of them. And we are dealing with the normal acceleration. So I'm going to write the equation A N is v square over rho this is the equation we had right mm -hmm. now we have two particles a and b let's say this is a and this is b so if that's the case i'm going to go a n for b or for a it's going to be V A square over rho A and A N for B is going to be V B square over rho B. That's technically how you find out velocity of each of those cars, right? The, the acceleration is constant. So for A, you're going to get point. 8 g let me go with each car with the same color code so it might be easier to follow right so for a 0.8 g is v a square over rho a or v a is square root of rho a times 0.8 g 
How much is G? Do you guys remember? 9.81. 9.81. The unit? Meters per second squared. Yes. So, and rho A is given 72 meters. Is this is a circle, so rho is constant. I want you guys to find VA and also do the same for VB and tell me what the number is. And please, everybody, again, these are simple calculations. But when you do it yourself, the equation kind of sticks in your mind and your memory better. Any number? Come on, guys. This should take like 30 seconds. This should be 23. Point seventy seven and correct me if I'm wrong, okay? So how did you get rho? Rho is the radius of curvature which is given. Okay. 88 for blue, 72 for red. That's a part of the equation. I mean, the, the information you have. I got 2377 and 2628. Is this correct? That's what I got. Yeah. Okay. Now, we have the velocity for A and B. The problem says how long it takes for each of them to go from C to C prime or whatever it is. Now, I'm going to get the path of motion for each of them. So for blue, as I said, it's going to go through this blue path. And for the red, it's gonna go like this. Oops. It's gonna go straight, half a circle, and straight, right? And they both have constant velocity. Let's see how much is the length of the path for each of them. So for A, how much is SA based on this geometry? Apparently, is a half a circle, right? Plus two straight lines. How much are the two straight lines? Because these two circles are tangent. Look at here for a second, please, everyone. These two circles are tangent here, right? So if this is RA and this is RB, the difference here is going to be RB minus RA, right? So you have two RB minus RA plus half a circle, the path for A. Let me write it. Two RB minus RA plus half a circle, which is going to be pi RA. 
And for SB, again, look at here for a second. For SB, it's simply half a circle, right? So it's going to be pi RB. You give me these two numbers. Um, 194.2 meters for SA and 257.6 meters for SB. 194, how much is it? Yeah, 194.2. How do you get that? Um, because pi times RA, which is 72, is 226. Right. Plus, this is 32. Oh, my bad, my bad. I subtracted for some reason. Okay, that's fine. So 258. Point one nine. That's what I got. Meter. Yeah. So SA and SB, you know it. VA and VB, you know it. How you find the time? Simply the time is going to be TA. Is going to be SA divided by VA and TB is going to be SB divided by VB. So I'm going to get here 258.19 divided by 23.77. And here I'm going to get 276.46 divided by 26.28. And if you calculate that, you get 10.86 seconds here. And 10.52 seconds here. So the blue car gets there a fraction of second earlier even though it has the long you see it has the longest longer path to cover right but because it has a longer curvature it's allowed to go with a little higher velocity and i'm sure you all have faced or felt that when you drive if the curvature of the road is sharp, you have to go slower. Otherwise, you may slide out or maybe roll, right? If the curvature is bigger, you can go with higher speed. That's technically the same effect that you see here. Right? Any question? So these were two examples to... Um, can you guys do something like this in a quiz? By the way, next week, we're going to have a quiz. I was planning to have it on Monday, but because the homeworks are due on Monday, I'm going to give you an extra day if you would practice more or something, or maybe I post the solutions on Tuesday and you can compare your results, see what you did right or wrong. So next Wednesday, we have a quiz that covers chapter 12. Okay. Now, the next topic is polar coordinate system. Or in 3D, you can call it um, cylindrical coordinate system. 
in polar coordinate system, as you are familiar from your with, with from your math, you have an origin for the base of your position. You have a reference line that you measure the angles. So for any point P, wherever it is, the vector R represents its position. R can be expressed in terms of the length of R and the angle theta. Now, if you want to do something similar to what we did for normal tangential, you may say, I want to have two unit vectors. The two unit vectors that we use here are in R direction, which that we call it UR, and perpendicular to R direction, that we call it u theta. And u theta is in the direction of increasing theta. Right? Now, is the definition clear? Right? Again, u r and u theta are unit vectors. Their magnitude is one, but you may realize that as p moves and the vector r changes, the orientation of u r and u theta changes. And remember, again, we make this two perpendicular. U theta is always normal to u r. And now you see in some cases, this is a better way to express or explain the motion. For example, if you want to find the position, for position, you have the magnitude of r times the unit vector, and that gives you the vector r. So this unit vector makes life easier, right? Oops, sorry. Any question about the concept of u r, u theta, and things like that? And remember, u r is always in the direction of r going out. It's not backward. It has to go from center or from the origin to the point going outward. If this is the case, as I mentioned, you can find the position vector using its magnitude times unit vector r. Remember, O is always fixed. Unlike center of curvature in normal tangential that would move along with the path, this O is always fixed. U R is from origin to the point going outward. U theta is perpendicular to R with direction of increasing theta. And U R and U theta are always perpendicular to one another, as I mentioned. So these are the four characteristics of polar coordinate system. Any question? Hi, see, you're good? Okay. Now, this is R. Define the position. As we talked before, after position comes displacement, which is like delta R. After displacement comes velocity and then acceleration. Let's see how we can find the velocity of particle P in polar coordinate system. And to do that, let me go back again to the tablet so we can derive it easier here. Let's say this is like the origin of the thing. The path of motion could be anything. Let's say like this is like that, okay? And we are somewhere like here. This is vector R. This 
is going to be U R. And this is going to be U theta. Okay. This is point O, this is point P here. And as I mentioned, RP, or you can call it R, doesn't matter, right? In this coordinate system, I express it with the magnitude of R times UR, okay? Now, if I want to do the velocity, what was the equation for velocity? Do you remember how we find velocity? The derivative, derivative of displacement. Exactly. It's going to be dr dt, which is going to be d r u r dt, right? Again, do you remember? This u r and this u theta are going to change as the point p moves along this, right? So they're not constant. Therefore, they have derivatives, which means if I want to take the derivative of this respect to time, I have to get dr dt u r plus r d u r dt okay now dr dt we can simply call it r dot the change of the magnitude of this r the question is how we're going to find this guy now to do that you guys write this down I'm going to go back to this plot. Let's say we go from point P to point P prime, right? And then the unit, the, the vector R prime This is going to be your R prime, right? Then your UR is going to be this. And your U theta is going to be that. If this goes by a small displacement of DR, which we can express it like this right let's call this angle d theta right small change in theta can i do that that's how we call them right remember this is kind of exaggerated plot these two are supposed to be very close and this angle should be very small right but for graphical you know, expression, I'm going to make it a little bigger. Now, du, I want to, dur, I want to see how much that is going to be, right? It's going to be ur prime minus ur, correct? The change of ur. This is the original ur. This is the final ur. There's an angle difference between them of d theta. You guys follow? Okay. Now I'm going to redraw them here to see what happens. Let's say, for example, and I'm drawing very large, right? This is UR. And let's say this is UR prime right and the difference between them
it's going to be this tiny red vector d u r how much is this angle again you guys can tell me uh, delta hmm? theta um, d I'm... theta right yeah d theta okay if this angle is a small can i say the magnitude of d u r which is this guy is equal to the radius times d theta yeah hmm? how much is the radius this length r one because it's no one because this is unit vector oh right here. right so if that's the case i can say the magnitude of dur this guy is going to be one times d theta correct which is technically d theta how about its direction look at here if this two, if this angle becomes smaller and smaller this goes close to 90 degree right remember we talk about limits differentials so if this is very small the red vector is going to be perpendicular to black vector correct what is the mm -hmm. direction for the red vector or what is the direction for perpendicular to ur what we called it u theta u theta exactly so if that's the case i can so the magnitude of u dur is going to be d theta and its direction is going to be technically in the direction of u theta right so if i want to write this again i'm going to write it so dur is going to be its magnitude which is d theta times its direction which is u theta correct you guys follow Now I will substitute this guy into this equation. Oops, sorry. Okay. So therefore, dur dt is going to be d theta dt u theta what is d theta dt we can call it the rate of the change of the angle theta right mm -hmm. and because every time derivative we express it by dot i can call this theta dot u theta now if i substitute this guy into this equation i'm going to do it again so v as a vector is going to be r dot u r plus r this r that i have here right theta dot u theta this is going to be your velocity so technically your velocity is going to have a component in r direction and a component in theta direction. Any question? You guys follow? Any question? Now, let's go back to this uh, 
you know, I'm going to read. Let's clean up this little bit to see how it goes. I'm going to get rid of some of this. Oops. That's okay. So you remember we talked about velocity and it had certain characteristics that we should never forget. What was that characteristic? Do you guys remember? If this is U R and U theta, right? Let's say this is U R. And this is U theta. And our velocity, obviously, I'm going to write it here. The velocity of point P. is going to have a component of r dot u r plus r theta dot u theta, right? Shouldn't the velocity be tangent to the path? How is possible that it has two components and it still remains tangent to the path? Hmm? Because the... the two components represent the x and y component. When you put them together, they become the tangent path. Well, I wouldn't say x and y, r and theta, but yes, that's the thing. So this is how it goes. Imagine this is the velocity, and I mentioned velocity has to be tangent to the path. So hopefully this is good enough to be tangent to the path. Let's say this is velocity of point P, right? I can divide it into two components. This is going to be VR, which is R dot, and this is going to be V theta, which is R theta dot. So we can call this component as vr and we can call this component as v theta so regardless of how the path of the motion is or whatever happens the velocity always remains tangent to the path so these two components will turn out in a way that their addition is going to be tangent to the path okay so we don't violate that make sense Okay, so this is how we get VR. Now that we are here, let's just determine V theta, sorry, the, the acceleration to see how it goes with that. This was the velocity. How about acceleration? How I can find acceleration of P, particle P? Take the derivative of the velocity. Exactly, so A, is going to be d v d t and v i have it here so it's going to be d d t of r dot u r plus r theta dot u theta and this is going to get a little ugly because none of this you see we have five terms here this guy 
this guy, this guy, this, this, and this, and none of them is constant, right? So when you take the, do the product rule, you have to expand this in a, this way. A is going to be dr dot dt times ur plus r dot dur dt and all these things is going to go for this guy then this is going to create three terms r dot theta dot u theta plus r let's just put it this way dr dt theta dot u theta plus r d theta dot dt u theta plus r theta dot d u theta dt right now dr dot d theta I can call it r double dot because it's the time derivative of r dot, yeah, right? dur dt, I already had it in the previous part, was theta dot, right? So it's going to be plus r dot theta dot u theta. This guy is going to be r dot theta dot u theta this guy is going to be r d u theta dot dt is the second derivative of theta right or first derivative of theta dot i can write it theta double dot okay remains this guy I let you guys write this down and kind of get it done. I'm going to find the last term, which I highlighted with yellow. I'm going to find this at last. Any question up to here for these four terms? It's just simple, you know, differentiation with respect to time. I'm going to write this plus. Let's calculate the last term here. You remember when we get dur dt, we ended up finding theta dot u theta, right? We derived before we got this. Now, similarly, I'm not going to go through that expressions, but if you did do u du theta dt, you're going to get minus theta dot u r. If you do the same unit vectors and differential between them and d theta and all of that, this is what you're going to get. Right? I think the derivation is in the book. If you want, you can look at it. Usually students are not much in, interested in derivation. We use the equation, so I explain it to understand how it's done. But that's it. So if I substitute this guy here for the last term, I'm going to get r theta dot minus theta dot ur. OK? This is going to be your acceleration. It looks a little you know, ugly or long. Any question about this red equation? Very good. Okay. Now let's simplify it and get the final equation. So A, you see, I have one term for UR 
and one term for u r here so i can put them together i can write r double dot minus r theta dot square u r right it's better to keep u r and u theta components together here you have r dot theta dot r dot theta dot two of them so you're going to get two r dot theta dot and here you have r theta double dot so this is going to be your final equation this part is going to be a r and this part is going to be a theta and you can simply write a is a r u r plus a theta u theta this is the r component of acceleration and this is the theta component of acceleration You don't have to memorize the derivation. We usually deal with this equation at the end and the velocity equation. I derived it so you can see where these terms come from. Because if I give you just a complicated equation, you may say, where the hell is coming from? So I try to show how this is developed and how it's done. Any question? Okay, let's go back to the slides. I have done the same much briefer in the slides, so you're going to see what happens. So for the velocity, we get dr dt. You do this, you separate them. You get this guy. This is vr, this is v theta for acceleration. And that's how you get, you see VR and V theta. The, the overall velocity will be tangent to the path. So that's the velocity part. And for the acceleration, we take the seven, second derivative. I didn't expand all of this. So you have now the details. This is acceleration in R direction. This is acceleration in theta direction. And any of them could be positive, negative, doesn't matter. Even for the velocity, it could go backward and make VR and V theta, either of them positive, negative. So to solve a problem, you need this equation and this equation for velocity. Too much to absorb? Yank, you're good? Hmm? You guys are good? Okay. I think this was a little complicated. I'm going to give you like two, three minutes of break, okay? This is like 11.07, you come back 11.10 and we solve the problems, okay? I know three minutes is not too much of break, but um, we need to move on to finish these things. So later you can have a longer break after the class. So I'm going to do this example. As you can see, you have a pin that follows this path of motion. It's a curvilinear motion, obviously. The equation for this path is given in terms of R and theta. You see X and Y, but obviously R theta are the dominant parameters here. So we may want to go with a polar coordinate system. 
at the instant that theta is 30 degree, theta dot and theta double dot are given, both of them positive. R is also given as a function of theta. We want to fi find the magnitude of the velocity and acceleration for the pin at this instant, which means when theta is 30. So I'm going to give you a few seconds to draw this, and I will do it myself too. How do we solve this problem, by the way? Let's go to the tablet again. Okay. So technically theta is given and theta dot and theta double dot are given. And we are looking to find the velocity and acceleration of point P, right? I'm going to start with velocity, right? VP as a vector, it's going to be VR, UR plus V theta. Which is going to be R dot UR plus R theta dot U theta. So I need to find these parameters, right? Theta is given. First of all, remember, we use degree for angles in many, many problems, right? But when you talk about theta dot or theta double dot, we never go degree per second or degree per square second. It's always radian. You have to translate it into radian per second. Otherwise, your units will not match, okay? That's why... In the problem, it also gives you radian per second and radian per square second. Now, I can find R obviously, right? So at theta equals 30 degree, we know that R is 0.2 plus 0.15 cosine theta. So, R is going to be 0.2 plus 0.15 cosine 30. And someone tells me how much is this? Uh, 0 0.13. Point. I'm sorry, plus 0.2. So this is going to be point three uh, point three. Three. Yeah, point three three. Yep. Yeah. And the unit will be let me see. It's meter, so it's going to be meter. Okay. Okay. Now how about R dot? 
because I also need to find R dot. How do I find R dot? Because I have to take the derivative of R respect to T, right? But R is given as a function of theta. How do we do this? You guys remember? Just put the equation of R in it, put the derivative of it, and then substitute the 30 degrees in it. Okay, but if you say like D of point 0.2 plus point 0.15, cosine theta dt, this is a function of r and t, this is function of th theta. How you differentiate this with respect to t? If, if r was, for example, 2t squared plus 3t, it was easy. You get dt, dr dt is like 4t plus 3, right? But your r is a function of theta and not function of time. And that's the question, right? There's something you should remember from your many, many measures years ago, like a couple of years ago. I'm gonna explain it how you do it. Please everybody pay attention because we're gonna do this million times in this course. I can write dr dt can I multiply it by d theta and divide it by d theta like this? Can I do that? Because d theta over d theta is one. Now I'm going to take these two together and these two together. So your r dot is technically dr d theta, d theta, dt, right? Now I can substitute this function here d of 0.2 plus 0.15 cosine theta d theta and how much is d theta dt um, i'm not looking for the magnitude oh. it's technically theta dot right so i can write it like that now you see, this function depends on theta. You can take the derivative with respect to theta. If I do that, my r dot is going to be minus 0.15 sine theta times theta dot. Correct? Because 0.2 is constant, doesn't have derivative. And the derivative of cosine theta is minus sine theta. That's what you get. You guys remember now? What do you call it? Chain rule? Any question about this? Okay. So if I substitute theta 30, I'm going to get minus 0.15 sine 30 and theta dot is 0.7. So someone tells me how much is this guy? Uh, negative 0 0.0525. And the unit? Radians per second. Meter per second. You remember this is R dot. No. So I get my R dot here and I got my R here, right? 
I can calculate my velocity now. Vp is going to be minus 0 0.0525 ur plus r theta dot, which is 0.33 times 0.7 u theta. right? And if you want to find the magnitude, how do we do that? The magnitude of VP is going to be square root of VR square plus V theta square, which is going to be 0.525 square plus 0.231 square And your VP as the magnitude is going to be 0 0.2369 meter per second. Okay. Do you guys get the same number? Yeah. Andrew, are you good with this? Everybody? Okay. Now, we need to find acceleration, right? For acceleration, obviously, the I'm going to write the equation. AP is going to be R double dot minus R theta dot square. Oops. UR plus R theta dot plus 2R dot theta dot U theta. This is the equation, right? Theta double dot is given. Let me see what we have or what we don't have. R dot and theta dot, I found it already. Theta double dot is given R, I found it, this and this. I only need to find R double dot, right? So mm -hmm. let's see what happens. I'm gonna start obviously from R dot. When R dot is minus 0.15, sine theta, theta dot, r double dot, which is dr dot dt. How, how I'm gonna find this guy? This is the equation, right? Mm -hmm. I have two terms, sine theta and theta dot. So I'm going to have to use a product rule again. And if I do that, my R double dot is going to be point minus point 15. So D sine theta DT times theta dot plus sine theta d theta dot dt, right? Again, here, you have sine theta and you differentiate with respect to t. So theta is not t, so we have to find somehow to take the different differentiation with respect to theta, right? So if that's the case, mm -hmm. I'm just gonna write this one. I'm not gonna do this all the time, just this first time to refresh your memory, right? So technically this, I can write it D, D sine theta, D theta, D theta, D T, right? And this becomes cosine theta, theta dot. And then you have another theta dot here. So if I simplify that, 
R double dot is going to be minus 15 cosine theta, theta dot square. Remember, we have one theta dot here and we create one from derivative. So it comes a square plus sine theta, d theta dot dt, theta double dot. Right? And now you can substitute the values cosine 30.7 square plus sine 30. What was the theta double dot 0.5? And if you calculate all of this, someone tell me how much it is. Okay. Negative point one zero one two. Yeah. The unit is going to be meters um, per, meter per second. second square. Exactly. Now I found this guy. Let's go back to AP. AP is going to be, I'm going to just substitute the values. Minus point. 10115 plus r, which was 0.33 theta dot square, which was 0.7 square times ur plus r, which is 0.33 theta double dot, which was 0.5 plus 2r dot. How much was R that? Zero five two five. It was negative, right? Yeah. Times theta dot, which is point seven u theta. And one of you guys calculate this and give me the number. You guys get the same numbers? Because I don't have this calculator like you guys. I'm just using my cell phone. And that's not the best way to do it sometimes. I got the same answers. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then if you want to find the magnitude of AP, AP as the magnitude is going to be a square root of 0 0.06055 square plus 0 0.0915 square. And then you get the square root. And if you do that, square plus.
and your AP is going to be 0. 0.1097 meter per second squared, right? Any question? That is how you deal with uh, polar coordinate system. As I mentioned before, if, let me just, so if R and theta are given as a function of time, How we solve them? For example, R is R of T and theta is theta of T, right? Then R dot is simply dr dt, you have them, and theta dot is d theta dt. This is much easier to do it, right? And then R double dot, you get it, and theta double dot. You get it, and then you can find VR, V theta, AR, and A theta. So this is kind of more straightforward compared to what we just did, which is, you know, you know more complex. You know, you have to take the derivative theta and then go from there, right? Any question? Right. Now let's go to the slides again. Now this is a problem of second type I just explained to you. Technically this rotates and the B goes up and down. So the position of B depends on theta and r, okay? Theta is given as a function of time. r is also given as a function of time. You want to find the velocity and acceleration when theta is three seconds. Can you do this? Okay, I'm going to give this as a bonus problem. What bonus problem is, sometimes when we get to lectures like this and explain how to do it, I give you the problem, you're gonna solve it tonight. I create a link to submit it tonight. So technically it's like a bonus problem, it's kind of like a lecture, but I give you a little challenge to do it yourself. It's that complicated, you can do it, right? And at the end, we have like maybe seven, four, six, whatever number of bonus problems. I give you between three to 5% extra point that will be added to final grade, right? For example, if you end up 86 and you get 4% of the bonus, that's going to be added and your 86 becomes 90, you go from B to A. Does that make sense? Do you like mm -hmm. it? Yes. Of course you like it. Yeah, who doesn't, right? I wouldn't say like free point, but it's kind of free point because this is an easy problem. We're going to do this a few times, but the point is you're going to do it today, okay? For bonus problems, I don't accept late submission because the whole point is I give you this now that everything is fresh in your mind, even after class is done, maybe before you have your lunch or after your lunch, you quickly solve it and post the solution. Okay. That's the whole purpose that kind of is a part of lecture ish. Okay. So the next part is going to be something not complicated. I'm going to explain it to you and you see it's not very complicated. The dependent motion. Sometimes the motion of a particle or its position depends on the motion and position of another particle. So they are not independent. This is a simple example to show you what that means. You may see that with this pulleys and you know um, this rope, if I 
push this A down, what happens to B? It rises. It goes up or vice versa. So technically B and A are not independent. If you move one of them, the other has to follow. You wanna see how we can solve problems like this. So for this case, see what happens. I'm gonna use usually a reference line. This is the position of A from center of this pulley and the position of B from the same place as this. And we know that the length of the rope is constant, right? So technically the length of the rope is from A to C. I want you guys to just pay attention. Don't do anything. Just look at the screen for five seconds or like 30 seconds. It's gonna be easy. The length of the rope is A to C, C to D, D to E, E to F, F to G, and G to H, right? So if I write that, this is the length of the cord or the rope. And of course it's constant. Now, you may realize that as I go up and down, this half circle that is red, this half circle and HG, they don't change. How much is AC? Is SA, right? Right? Yes. How much is BE and FG? It is SB, the SB. position of, technically B is here, but B goes with the center of rope. So that's another constant, right? So technically AC is SA, DE is SB, FG is also SB, and the rest are constant. They don't change, you know, as this goes up and then there's always half a circle of rope here, half a circle of rope here, and this HG, which is remain the same. So technically, if I consider these things and move C, D, E, F, and H, G to the other side, subtract from another constant number, the overall is going to be still constant, right? It's like the length of the rope is two meter. Those tinies are like, I don't know, 0.4 meter. You subtract them, it's still 2.6 is a constant number, right? So if that's the case, I can technically write 1SA plus 2SB is a constant. Whatever the number, we even don't know how much is, it doesn't matter, right? Does that make sense? Okay. Now, if I want to find velocity, what should I do? Take the derivative of this with respect to time, right? Right. DSA DT. is going to be VA, DSB, DT is going to be VB. What is the time derivative of a constant number? Zero. Zero. So technically, from this equation, you can relate velocities. VA plus 2VB is zero. Now you may realize that if SA increases, that means VA is positive. Is v pos VB positive or negative? Negative. Which means SB decreases, which makes sense. You know, A goes down, B goes up, or vice versa. When SB increases, that means VB is positive. A goes up, which means SA is decreases, and VA is negative. So here we don't go with X and Y. We go with the change of SA and SB. Make sense? Okay. Then if you want to find acceleration, what we're going to do, take the derivative of this. VA is going to be AA, VB is going to be AB, same thing here, right? So it's very easy. You find a constant length of a chord or something, or one way or another, you relate the geometry of A to B, and then you start taking the time derivatives. For the constant values, the time derivative is zero. For the rest, you get VA, VB, AA, AB. Any question about this concept? We're good? Okay, let's do this example. 
Now, I want you guys to look at this. Again, I'm going to put this as my reference line. I can go SA up to here or up to here. You may realize that's not a big deal because this is constant, right? So if that's the case, what should I write for the length of, length of the chord? Some constants, which we don't care. How much is this? SA, right? Mm -hmm. Another SA. So two SA. SB and another SB, two SB and one SC. So if you write that, you're going to get two SA plus two SB plus SC is constant. Whatever the constant is, we even don't know how much is the length of the course, so that doesn't matter. Time derivatives, 2VA, 2VB plus VC, 0. 2AA, 2AB, AC, 0. You may realize that here, we need to have two of them to find the third one, right? For example, A could go down, C could go down, and then if these two go down, positive, positive, this has to be negative. Or for example, A goes up, B goes down, depend on how they change, C may go up and down, right? This is what dependent motion means. I think we are, uh, do you guys want to stay another few minutes or we can finish this chapter next time? I think you can do the problems. And if you can't, on Monday, we're going to finish this. And then you have the evening to do maybe a couple of problems from this chapter, this part of the chapter. Is it good? Okay. I'm going to stop it here. So let me just stop this share screen. And I can stop the recording.